Uh, I'm Elliot Gerson of the Aspen Institute, and I would like to welcome all of you this beautiful morning. Uh, I've, uh, this is for uh, many of us the beginning of the summer. I've seen many friends this morning. I look forward to seeing many of you over the course of the summer. Uh, I am especially delighted to be able to introduce uh, this program this morning, particularly as it, in, as it represents a uh, partnership uh, with the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research. Uh, we are thrilled to have uh, uh, an involvement with them and frankly look forward to doing far more things with the AEI in the future. Uh, I'd also like to thank all of you for coming uh, at, one is, uh, at one of the very first morning sessions like this. Uh, many of you are missing your morning hike, I think, especially this is one of the few beautiful mornings we've had for those of you who've been here for a month or for a longer period of time. And so I'm very, very pleased to see all of you here this morning. Uh, the AI, uh, we have many friends uh, involved with the AI here this morning, uh, but of course most of you know it as one of the most distinguished institutions uh, in the country dedicated to public policy research across the spectrum of public policy from economics and, and uh, law to almost anything else that affects uh, the American system of government. And it is a private, it is nonprofit, it is nonpartisan, uh, although of course it does have a perspective uh, which we very much welcome here at the Aspen Institute. Uh, I would also, I, I think it's probably only appropriate to give a special thanks to the White House and the Treasury for releasing their sweeping regulatory plans uh, in conjunction with this event. Uh, I'm sure all of you have read the entire report. Probably most of you haven't even read the morning newspaper yet, but we will have a chance to talk about that as well. I know that at least Peter Wallace and one of the panelists has read it because I was invited to a webinar this afternoon in which he is going to explain it. So perhaps uh, 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 at least after the prepared remarks, we'll have an opportunity for that. Uh, the way we're going to operate this morning is I, in, in a minute, <clears throat> I'm going to turn things over to my friend and colleague here in Aspen, Caroline Heldman of National Public Radio. She uh, will introduce the panelists uh, one at a time. Uh, each of them will be speaking. Uh, we will uh, have ample time, I hope, at the end for questions and answers. Carolyn and I will probably start that out with a question or two, but please be thinking about questions you might like to ask. We have microphones at either side, and as this is all going to be broadcast in some fashion, I would ask you please to go to the microphone rather than ask your questions from the audience. Uh, so again, uh, welcome on behalf of the Aspen Institute. We're delighted you're here. We're thrilled to be doing this with the AEI, and I now turn things over to Caroline to introduce our very, very distinguished panel. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, everyone. Our first speaker this morning is Arthur C. Brooks. He's the president of AEI. Until January 1st, 2009, he was the Lewis A. Bantle Professor of Business and Government Policy at Syracuse University's Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. He's the author of Who Really Cares, which examines American charitable giving, Gross National Happiness, Why Happiness Matters for America, and How We Can Get More of It, and a textbook on social entrepreneurship. He was a consultant with the Rand Corporation from 1998 to 2008. He's assistant professor of public administration and economics at Georgia State University from 98 to 2001, a doctoral fellow at the Rand Corporation from 96 to 98, and interestingly, a French hornist with the Barcelona Symphony Orchestra from 1983 to 1992. He holds a PhD in policy analysis from the Party Rand Graduate School, an MA econ in economics from Florida Atlantic University, and a BA in economics from Thomas, and Thomas Edison State College. Welcome, Arthur Brooks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to all of you. What a delight to be here in Aspen uh, for AEI. We've, uh, we've not been in Aspen before. We spend a lot of time every year in Colorado in Beaver Creek where we have a, an annual world forum for four days each year, which starts this afternoon. Uh, this is different for us, however. The Aspen Institute, which is a, a, an extremely distinguished institution, uh, 
great prestige, known for open debate and for uh, the fair treatment of ideas. We, we couldn't be more honored to be here today. So thanks, uh, thank you to our hosts, to the Institute. Um, I'd like to say special thanks to Frieda, Frieda and Peter Wallison, who were our hosts last night for an event with some friends uh, here. And, uh, and to all of you for taking some time. Uh, also, my compliments on living in such a beautiful place. It's uh, easy when you come here to see why one wouldn't leave. Um, perhaps to those of you who have to leave after the summer, my condolences. Um, <clears throat> the, the American Enterprise Institute was founded in 1943 on three basic principles. Uh, expanding liberty, increasing individual opportunity, and defending free enterprise. One of our non-negotiable principles, uh, which we share with the Aspen Institute, is open debate. Uh, we're going to talk today about something that has been in the public debate a lot. It has to do with the financial crisis and, and who's to blame. Anytime there is a national security or, or economic crisis and it starts to look like it might get resolved, uh, conversation always turns to blame. It's an amazing thing. We have to figure out who was at fault. We have to establish a narrative about what really happened. And as you can imagine, at AEI, where we do about 250 events every year at our headquarters in Washington, D.C., a lot of those are dedicated to what really happened and what indeed is going to happen in the future in the financial crisis. We look at all sides of this and we try to sort out what this emerging narrative is. One of the things that we understand in, this, in, the, uh, in the current environment is that getting the narrative right is critically important for not repeating the problem. One of the problems that we have all throughout history, of course, is that when we describe what has happened incorrectly, we make the same mistakes. And this is what we're trying to avoid and what we're going to be trying to discuss here today. So I want to give a few comments to try to frame the discussion about the narrative about what's going on before we go into more specifics uh, with my colleagues, uh, uh, Peter and Marty. Um, the narrative that we have right now from uh, the Bush administration and the Obama administration and Capitol Hill and federal bureaucracies and lots of people who are in the know goes something like this. Uh, markets failed. There was a lot of deregulation. There was a dogmatic reliance on capitalism and markets failed. Markets failed and that created a whole lot of instability in our system, which is just more evidence that capitalism is an unstable system. You might like it sometimes, especially when you're making a lot of money and your 401k is cooking, but you don't like it when it exposes our whole country to so much risk. We get booms, we get busts, we get innocent victims, and something's got to be done. So what's got to be done according to this narrative and according to George W. Bush and Barack Obama? There are three things. Number one is fiscal stimulus. We have to spend a lot of money. Now, some of you think that government spending money is a nice thing, and some of you think it's not a nice thing, but the narrative says that if you're a reasonable person, you accept it. You bite your lip and you say, the government's going to spend a whole lot of money because that's the only way that our economy's not going to melt down further. Um, now, the, why is the government spending money? Because people won't. And if people don't, our economy stops, and so we have to get things moving again. The second solution is more regulation. We have to regulate the economy more than it has been in the past because the, un the inherent instability of capitalism and the market failure are evidence that the government was not uh, intervening enough in the workings of the private economy. And the third assumption is, or the third uh, implication of all this, is that we need a much, much bigger government that intrudes more in the private economy. Now, why? Because the government has to figure out, has to be the one spending the money and the government has to be the one doing the regulating. And that means we simply need, reasonably, we need more government. Now, that's a very strong narrative about what happened, and, and it's accepted by Republicans, and it's accepted by Democrats, it's accepted by lots and lots of citizens. And I want to I ask you to think about a couple of the core dogmas that are embedded in this narrative. And maybe we can loosen them a little bit, and our panelists are going to talk about them a little bit more even. The two key assumptions at the center of the emerging narrative about the financial crisis are number one, free markets failed. Assumption number two is that the only way to save our economy is through massive government spending. Those are the two things that everybody who's smart knows, apparently. Now, the problem is, <clears throat> the reason that, I mean, we all were given discomfort by this crisis. I mean, I didn't walk away from a mortgage and I didn't get wasn't sitting on the board of an irresponsible Wall Street firm, 
and I didn't get a bailout, but still the value of my pension decreased by, uh, who knows, I didn't even look, a lot. And so did a lot of yours, and it felt lousy. It felt bad. And, and so it seemed that the markets that were supposed to give us so much prosperity, they must have failed. Well, it turns out that's not the problem. The reason that you and I were so uncomfortable in this crisis is not because, the government, not because markets failed, it's because markets succeeded. And it went something like this. For a long time, the malfeasance and uh, poor policy in this country created an inability of markets to react to real circumstances. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac created policies, as we're going to hear from my colleague Peter Wallison, that made it impossible for market signals to say what houses were really worth. Uh, mortgage lenders told people that the value of houses could not fall. People believed that they could take undue risk. There was poor corporate governance on Wall Street that leveraged uh, their funds 30 to 1. These things actually were not letting markets to succeed, not letting markets succeed, but in the end, they did. In the end, market success is what actually led to this meltdown. Now that's an important distinction. We can complain all we want about market success, but it's a different thing than saying that markets don't work. And it feeds into the notion that capitalism failed in a rather different way. What we find is if we believe and we understand that markets actually succeeded and that's the problem, then to say that capitalism failed is to say when markets work, it means, it means they create discomfort and that means capitalism failed. Indeed, socialism is always and everywhere a response to market success. That is a truism around the world and across time. So, the second is, what do we do about it? What do we do about this crisis? And as an economist, I hear all the time from people that all economists understand that we have to spend a lot of money. And I'm here to tell you, if you are skeptical that the $9.3 trillion in debt we are going to accrue over the next 10 years, according to Mr. Obama's own budget office, if you believe that that's a little problematic and you're worried how we're going to pay for that or how, your, how my kids and your grandkids and such are going to pay for that, that's not a disreputable position. It's okay for you to say that in public. And let me tell you, what, let me tell you uh, how you can uh, come out on this issue and feel good about it. Stimulus spending that we're seeing a lot of, the trillions and trillions in sp stimulus spending comes in three parts. There, and all government spending is of three types when it's trying to stimulate the economy. The first part is money that actually stimulates the economy. It is, and either it is intended to do so. Either it's effective or it's ineffective, but it's intended to really stimulate the economy. Let me give you, give you an example. Um, from the current stimulus package, we, we're spending $600 million on new police cruisers for Youngstown, Ohio. Economists will argue some that that will stimulate the economy in an infrastructural effective way and some economists will say that won't be effective. But that's supposed to stimulate the economy in public infrastructure. There's a second category which is spending on social engineering. Uh, one of the great uh, complaints that people on the political left had about the Bush administration, one of the many great complaints they had about the Bush administration after 9-11 was that 9-11 was used as a pretext to put in lots of policies on national security that the Bush administration always wanted to put in, but never had the excuse. And when people panicked, then they could do it. Well, that's how economists understand a lot of the, so the social spending that's happening right now. It's an, sort of an economic 9-11, and the Bush and Obama administrations, particularly the Obama administration, wants to do a whole lot of boilerplate social engineering spending, and now is the chance. Okay, now. Some of you think that that social engineering spending is appropriate and good news, and some of you think it's bad news and inappropriate. And that's an important issue of open debate, but it's indisputable that that's happening. What's an example of social engineering spending? In Annapolis, Maryland, uh, we're spending tens of millions of dollars to fund a program for residents to reduce their carbon footprint and train programs to meet new green technologies. Some of you like that a lot, but it is a kind of social engineering. Okay, the third category is something that none of us like. It's called pork. And it's in every kind of government stimulus. What's an example of pork? Austin, Texas is putting in a 36-hole environmentally friendly Frisbee golf course with 600 million of your dollars. Okay, now, it's pretty easy to get annoyed about. I mean, maybe you're an absolute Frisbee enthusiast and you live in Austin and you say, that's not pork. That's absolute stimulus. I'm sorry. 
there's not an economist who would agree with you out there. That's pork, is the bottom line. Now, the reason that you can, despite the fact that we know that we're in economic discomfort, and there are things that the government can and should do. You can still reputably say, I think the stimulus package was a bad idea. Is because categories number two and three bring real costs to our nation. It is not costless to socially engineer. It is not costless to waste money on pork-ridden, earmarked projects around this country that will be paid for by future generations. How much do they cost? That's what we need to talk about. Do they outweigh the benefits? Maybe. If you think they do, it's okay to say no to stimulus. Okay, now what I want to do is turn this over now on a more technical level to my colleagues Peter Wallace and Marty Feldstein to talk about some of the details of what's gone on in the financial crisis and, and, and our reactions to it such that we can stimulate more open discussion with you. In conclusion, I'd like to say once again thank you for giving us this opportunity to talk about the big issues of the day. We're looking forward to your perspective and thank you so much for your hospitality. Hello. Our next speaker is Peter J. Wallison. He's a co-director of AEI's program on financial policy studies. He researches banking, insurance, and securities regulation. As general counsel of the U.S. Treasury Department, he had a significant role in the development of the Reagan administration's proposals for the deregulation of the financial services industry. He also served as White House counsel to President Ronald Reagan and is the author of Ronald Reagan, The Power of Conviction and the Success of His Presidency, among many other books. He's a member of the Shadow Financial Regulatory Committee from 1991 until the present, counsel to President Ronald Reagan, as I mentioned, general counsel to the U.S. Treasury Department from 81 to 85. He was a special assistant to Governor Nelson A. Rockefeller, counsel during Rockefeller's vice presidency of 72, from 72 to 76. He's a graduate of Harvard Law School and holds a BA from Harvard College. Uh, we're going to use a, a screen here for some PowerPoint slides, if you all don't mind. So let's see how this works. If this doesn't cut me in half, um, I'll continue. Be close. Great. Stop. All right. Thanks very much for being here. Arthur has said just about everything one wants to say in the way of welcome to all of you. Um, one, one of the things that I like to say that's a little simpler than what Arthur said is uh, the diagnosis determines the prescription. And uh, I, I think if we are to understand what happened to us, we, if we are to understand what happened in this financial crisis, we really have to understand what, what caused the crisis. And uh, I'm going to go through a little bit of that with you. Of course, my perspective is going to be uh, that it was not a failure of capitalism, that in fact it was a failure of government policy. And uh, I'll try to explain why government policy was the precipitating thing uh, that caused this terrible event, something that hasn't, we haven't seen since the Great Depression, uh, to uh, be uh, the subject that uh, we've all been talking about for such a long time. And during the, the, the uh, question period after this, uh, and after Marty Feldstein speaks, um, maybe we can talk also about the proposals that the administration has just made to address uh, what they see as the problem. Okay. I think this is uh, the first slide. I have to get used to this clicker. But um, the reason we titled this what we did, a failure of capitalism or a failure of, uh, or, or a problem of government, policy was because a book was published relatively recently within the last couple of months by Richard Posner, a very well-known and widely respected judge 
uh, and the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals in Chicago. And Judge Posner wrote a very uh, provocative book entitled A Failure of Capitalism. Uh, and he stated what I guess we would say is the narrative uh, that Arthur Brooks was talking about, and that is without any government regulation of the financial industry, the economy would still in all likelihood be in a depression. We are learning from it that we need a more active and intelligent government to keep our model of a capitalist economy from running off the rain, uh, rails. The movement to deregulate the financial industry went too far by exaggerating the resilience, the self-healing powers of laissez-faire capitalism. That's a very good statement of what Arthur was talking about. Now, what deregulation could Judge Posner have been talking about? Um, we have all heard about the Glass-Steagall Act having been repealed. We've heard about the failure to um, uh, regulate uh, credit default swaps because of something called the Commodity Futures Modernization Act. And uh, Judge Posner cites money market mutual funds, which he says weaken banks by competing with them, drawing a lot of deposits out of the banks, making the banks have to take more risks in order to compete with these money market mutual funds. But I'd like to say first, now, I don't want to go into a lot of detail on any of these things because we don't have time and we want to leave enough time for the, uh, for the question period. But I, I just want to mention a few things like the Glass-Steagall Act. Um, the Glass-Steagall Act was, in fact, in a sense, repealed in 1999. When it was, the, originally it had prevented banks from engaging in the underwriting and dealing in securities, and also preventing them from being affiliated with firms that do that. What the uh, repeal in 1999 did was eliminate the affiliation provisions. Banks are still restricted from dealing in securities. Now, if we look at the problems that we have with banks today, I want to say two things about that. First, banks are the most heavily regulated institutions in our society. It's important to understand because the prescription that we are hearing is more regulation is necessary. But as I will get to in a moment, we have about as much regulation as anyone could have imagined uh, when we put in the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation Improvement Act in 1991, and yet that hasn't prevented us from having the most serious banking crisis in 70 years. So the, it's not a question of uh, the, uh, the repeal of any uh, particular law like Glass-Steagall, uh, because banks got into trouble by doing what banks always do. They made very bad loans. And the securities firms that got into trouble uh, were not at all affiliated with banks. That is Merrill Lynch and, and uh, J.P. Morgan, or Morgan Stanley, rather, and, uh, and Goldman Sachs. They were not affiliated with banks. And so they didn't get into trouble because of the uh, repeal of Glass-Steagall, and neither did banks because they continued to do exactly what banks had always done. Um, the question of laissez-faire capitalism. Um, no one who knows anything about the regulation of our financial markets thinks that we have laissez-faire capitalism, nor was anyone for that. All the financial institutions are in one way or another regulated in the way they interact with the public. Um, only a small group of financial institutions, that is banks, that are backed by the government with deposit insurance are regulated. Others regulated for safety and soundness, that is, the amount of capital they hold and the, the kinds of investments they could make. Okay, now, I put this up not because I expect anyone to be able to read it, but I pulled this out of a New Yorker magazine um, just a, a week or so ago because it fascinated me. This was just a list of the various things that uh, you could blame for this terrible crisis. Um, and uh, obviously, I'm not going to address all of them, but it shows how complex uh, this, uh, this whole issue can become because we have so many culprits. Uh, and I could add to this list, actually, just from the reading I do in the newspapers. Okay, well, why did this thing happen? Why did we, why have we encountered the, one of the worst financial crises uh, since the Great Depression? Now, we knew there was a housing bubble, and the housing bubble deflated. 
We also know that we always have housing bubbles. We also have other kinds of bubbles because we're human beings and because we believe that when things are going well, they will continue to go well um, no, matter, uh, no matter what others tell us. We think that, also we might think we're smart enough to get out before the bubble deflates. Whatever it is, bubbles occur and will always occur as long as we have free markets. But the question really is, why did this particular bubble result in a worldwide financial crisis? The problem was not just inflated home prices, and this is my thesis, but poor quality of mortgages that are now on bank balance sheets. So culprit number one, from my perspective, is government housing policy. Uh, there have been 70 years of increasing loan, you'll see this uh, this acronym LTV a few times on the screen. That means loan to value ratios. And what you mean, what I mean is when you make a mortgage or you receive a mortgage, there's a difference between the amount of the, the loan and the amount of equity you have in the home. If you have an 80% loan to value, there's 20% equity put into the home. If you have a 90% uh, loan to value, uh, there's much less equity, and if you have a 100% loan to value, and as you'll see, many mortgages are like that, you have no equity in the home. So over 70 years, this particular thing, loan to value, has gradually deteriorated from about 35% in the 30s to just about zero in 2006. This was because of something called the Community Reinvestment Act, but principally because of something, these two entities called Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. I'll have to explain to you why it happened. Uh, there are other culprits. I'm not going to talk about those. We don't have time. Um, they're less important in my view, but they are also various elements of government policy. Um, U.S., the United States, has always favored um, increasing home ownership. There are great reasons for better, more home ownership and the United States has always worked to increase home ownership. Um, the first major effort, as a matter of fact, was begun by President Hoover in the 1920s. Uh, various things were done to make it easier for banks to make these loans, and of course, when the Depression came along, that was one of the things that caused banks to get into serious trouble. In the 1930s, we set up something called savings and loans. Many of you may remember that uh, in the late 1980s, Savings and loans failed at enormously high rates, and we had to bail them out at a cost to taxpayers of about $150 billion. Um, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are essentially successors to the SNLs. Um, Fannie was established in 1938 during the Depression and was privatized in 1970. When I say privatized, they were allowed to sell their shares to the public. Uh, they became uh, listed on the New York Stock Exchange. In fact, they were one of the most um, uh, attractive investments on the New York Stock Exchange until they ran into the problems that inevitably would occur because of the way they were structured. Freddie Mac was established in 1970 and privatized in 1989. Fannie and Freddie in 1992, and this is very important, were given an affordable housing mission. That is, Congress said to them, um, well, we're doing all these wonderful things for you. We're, we are allowing you to have various connections to the federal government. I won't go into the details of those, but the market treats you as though, in fact, you are backed by the government, and therefore, we're going to ask something of you. Um, we want you to make investments in affordable housing. Uh, there were also, at the same time in, in that period, it was actually 1993, when uh, regulations were adopted under the, something called the Community Reinvestment Act that required national banks or all insured banks to make the same kinds of loans, that is, to people who could not otherwise afford homes. The idea was to increase home ownership in the United States, but you'll notice that it wasn't a government subsidy program that did this. They took private enterprises, Fannie and Freddie were at this point private enterprises, they were owned by shareholders. Banks, insured banks, were private enterprises, even though backed by the government through insured deposits, and they were told, we want you to make these kinds of loans. Affordable housing loans, which, 
as I will explain, really meant loans to people who you would or not ordinarily uh, make loans to because they don't have the, uh, the credit resources, and in some cases, uh, they have severely blemished credit. Okay, now what are Fannie and Freddie? I mentioned that they're shareholder-owned. They were called government-sponsored enterprises because they were set up and given missions by the government. They were perceived in the market as having um, uh, government backing. The, they, they, however, came to dominate their field, um, uh, uh, driving out of the secondary mortgage market where uh, organizations can buy mortgages from banks and sell them then to uh, financial institutions in the United States and around the world. They drove everyone out of their market because they could borrow at much lower rates than anyone else. Um, so they then set the, the, uh, the terms for the quality of mortgages that, that uh, were made during the period that they were operating. And generally, those mortgages were of very high quality. They were considered prime mortgages. And in fact, it was a synonym for a prime mortgage that it was sold to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac because they insisted on high down payments, maybe 20%. And in fact, by statute, they were required uh, to uh, get down payments of 20%, that is loans to value of no more than 80%. And they generally followed those rules well into the middle of the 1990s. But um, after they were given this housing mission, this affordable housing mission in 1993, um, they came under the regulation of the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And there was pressure from Congress and there was pressure from the administration uh, to uh, make more affordable housing loans. So there, seven times during the next 13 years, the HUD regulations were adjusted and edited and uh, it tightened so that they forced Fannie and Freddie to make more uh, subprime and non-prime loans. Beginning in uh, in the mid-90s, uh, the regulations required about 30% of their loans, that is the 30% of the loans that they would buy from the, the originators of these loans, um, would have to be to low and moderate income borrowers. Um, by 2005, 55% of those loans had to be, from, uh, be made to low or moderate income borrowers and 25% uh, had to be to low or very low income borrowers. Um, their regulator was an organization called the Office of Federal Housing Enterprise Oversight, OFEO, and it was a very weak regulator. I won't explain why it was a weak regulator, but um, Fannie and Freddie had a lot to say about what powers their regulator was given. Um, so the only way that Fannie and Freddie could um, meet the obligations that HUD was putting upon them was to reduce mortgage quality and take more risk. And that very weak regulator was unable to stop them from doing that. So HUD was the mission regulator. OFEO, as I described it, was their safety and soundness regulator. Uh, the safety and soundness regulator had very little power. HUD was directing them to make very weak mortgages. So. Loosened credit standards were the result. Um, and up until the mid-1990s, as I in indicated, Fannie and Freddie did very little. Um, that that uh, 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 created in, in the way of creating low-quality mortgages. But under HUD pressure, under congressional pressure too, by 1998, Fannie was offering a mortgage that was 97% LTV. In other words, 3% equity. And by 2001, no down payment at all. Um, their incremental purchases of mortgages from 19 of subprime and alt A, um, sorry, I didn't define alt A. An alt A mortgage, a uh, uh, subprime mortgage, let me put it this way, a subprime mortgage is one to, to a person or a borrower who has blemished credit. Um, it's a weak mortgage for that reason because of the quality, you might say, of the borrower. Um, an Alt-A mortgage is one that has weak quality inherently in the mortgage agreement itself, like a very low down payment, like uh, uh, a negative amortization of the mortgage, 
um, like a very low teaser rate with a reset to a much higher rate. Those are the kinds of things that uh, make a mortgage alt A. Subprime refers to a generally a, a person, a borrower, who actually has uh, blemished credit. So the, uh, the incremental purchases that Fannie and Freddie made, the numbers are pretty big here, at least um, they used to be big, uh, maybe. Uh, recently, they haven't, they've, they've shrunk, but between 1993 and 2008, Fannie and Freddie poured $2.6 trillion into making very weak mortgages, subprime and Alt-A. So, um, they were still dominating the market uh, between 1994 and 2003. Uh, their share of the market rose from, that is, the share of all mortgages that were made in the United States rose from 37% to 57%. Um, in 2003, the subprime portion of the market when they started out was 6%. In, 2005, in 2004, the chairman of uh, Fannie and Freddie went around the country saying, send us your subprime mortgages. We think we want to, we want to make, we want to buy those mortgages from you. They went to originators conferences, they went to banking conferences, and they made speeches like that, and so subprime began to rise. It was 14% by the end of 2004, then it was 16%, it was 20% by the end of 2006. From 2005 through 2007, our friends Fannie and Freddie bought over $1 trillion in subprime and Alt-A loans, and these were 50% of all their purchases in those years. Uh, for total holdings at the time they were actually taken over by the government in September of 2008 of $1.6 trillion of such mortgages, which amounted to 10 million loans. Now, this worked in terms of home ownership. It did, it, it did help. Um, and here I want to point out that this is not a partisan issue. Um, it was the, it were Democratic administrations and Republican administrations that worked through HUD to insist that Fannie and Freddie buy more mortgage, more subprime and Alt-A mortgages. The rates uh, of home ownership, which had been about 64% from, uh, oh, for 30 years, suddenly began to move in the middle 1990s. They moved to 67.5% by the end of the Clinton administration, and then they reached a high of 69.2% in the Bush administration. Again, these administrations were following out a long-term U.S. government policy to uh, improve home ownership. But the only reasonable explanation for this tremendous increase, uh, given historical uh, the stability of, of home ownership over time, this tremendous increase in just a few years between mid-90s and about uh, 2006, the only explanation for that is the loosened credit standards and the availability. Can you still hear me? It sounds as though the, uh, the mic has gone out. Um, the, the, uh, our, our mic man has come back. Okay, thank you. Um, the, uh, the only explanation for this is the availability of credit and the, loose cre and the loose, loosened credit standards that HUD was demanding. So, there is talk, too, about Fannie and Freddie competing with private label mortgage-backed uh, securities. Now, private label were things done by banks, by securities firms, and other financial intermediaries. They also were engaged in making, uh, in buying these very low quality loans and, and selling them. And those loans are all over the world in the, in the uh, balance sheets of banks and other financial institutions. And as they are failing, they are the things that are weakening these institutions. Now, the, what Fannie and Freddie did, however, was stimulate what the private sector people were doing because Fannie and Freddie was bu were buying uh, these, uh, the uh, securitized uh, 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 bank, uh, I'll, I'll, I haven't defined mortgage-backed securities, but I think you understand what they are. The F Fannie and Freddie were buying uh, these mortgage-backed securities from the private sector. Um, they, they bought about 100, uh, and $80 billion worth of those things in 2004. And then they started bar buying the subprime directly from the originators. Um, the purchases rose to 
as I indicated before, in 2006. A competition between the two of them, Fannie and Freddie struggling to meet HUD's requirements, um, a ready buyer for anything of a subprime or, or a non-prime nature, um, drove down the risk premia that would normally come with a subprime or an all-day loan, making them much cheaper, making it much easier for people to qualify for them and, and take out those mortgages. And in 2006, um, the, the, the private label groups backed off uh, because S&P, Standard & Poor's, which had been rating um, their mortgage-backed securities as AAA, decided that uh, this was these, these inst instruments were not uh, as non-risky as AAA. We know now, of course, that a lot of things they were rating AAA were not um, uh, as good as AAA securities normally are. But, uh, but S&P decided they would not rate some of these subprime tranches of mortgage-backed securities as AAA, and as a result, the private sector groups backed out of the market. Fannie and Freddie, however, kept lending. So what does the market look like today? Subprime and all-day loans. This is, I'm talking about all single-family mortgages in the United States, over $4 trillion worth, 44% of all single-family mortgages in the United States. 10 million held or guaranteed by Fannie and Freddie with a value of 1.6 trillion. I'm estimating that when Fannie and Freddie are fine, when the accounts are finally done for Fannie and Freddie, uh, they will have lost about $400 billion, which you, the taxpayers, will pay for, just as you paid for bailing out the SNLs with $150 billion in 1991. Um, their, their portfolio includes 60% Alt-A and 34% uh, subprime. Uh, that is, uh, of the total amount outstanding of each category, Fannie and Freddie hold those percentages. And finally, there are 15 million private label held by the banks and other investors around the world with a value of about $2.5 trillion. Those are also failing. Okay. Why so much subprime and Alt-A? And this is the key question. Fannie and Freddie needed subprime to meet HUD regulations. Between 1993 and 2008, their incre incremental purchases, as I said, were about $2.6 trillion. Originators through, what originators would do when you're told, you're a, you're a business person, right, and you're told by, a, by an organization like Fannie and Freddie, which has essentially unlimited funds, you're told, send me these things, well, of course you're going to produce them, and they produce them. Uh, and what they would do is they would throw these things up against the automated underwriting systems of Fannie and Freddie. And if the un automated underwriting systems accepted them, and Fannie and Freddie adju adjusted their systems so that they would accept subprime and Alt-A loans, if they were accepted, all well and good, you got paid for your mortgages. If they were returned to you because they didn't meet whatever standards Fannie and Freddie had, then you sold them to Wall Street. Um, but in any event, it created this engine uh, based on Fannie and Freddie's huge money, the, a huge amount of money that Fannie had available, which produced this gigantic um, fund of Alt-A and subprime mortgages. I'll end with this uh, because I think it's very illustrative. If you look at this, if, if you look at this uh, chart, this was prepared by Fannie Mae. And um, you, I want you to look at the, the cohorts. Uh, you might be able to see them from the back, but on the very extreme left side of what you're looking at is the, is the 2007 cohort of mor mortgages that were made. And you can see how those are failing. Now, this is not only subprime. This is all their prime loans as well as their subprime. And as I think I told you, about 40 to 44 percent of their loans are subprime and alt A. So if you include all of their mortgages, look, look at the failures that are occurring in 2007. That's not from their prime, and some of it is because we're in a recession, but the rest is coming from the, the very poor mortgages they bought in 2007. Look at 2006, even more failures occurring. 2005, again, you can see that they were scraping the bottom of the barrel and buying uh, some of the worst junk that was available to them, um, all because they were required by government policy uh, to take on these particular risks. Okay, that's all I have to say about this. I hope you'll take it on board. And during the, the question period, uh, maybe I can answer some of the questions that all of this detail have raised. Thank you.
Our next speaker is Martin Feldstein. He's the George F. Baker Professor of Economics at Harvard University and President Emeritus of the National Bureau of Economic Research. He served as President and CEO of the NBER from 1977 to 82 and 84 to 2008. He continues as a research associate there. From 82 through 84, Martin Feldstein was Chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors and President Reagan's Chief Economic Advisor. He served as president of the American Economic Association in 2004. In 06, President Bush appointed him to be a member of the president's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board. In 09, President Obama appointed him to be a member of the president's Economic Recovery Advisory. Dr. Feldstein is a director of two corporations, American International Group and Eli Lilly, and an economic advisor to several businesses and government organizations in the US and abroad. Martin Feldstein is a graduate of Harvard College and Oxford University. Welcome, Mr. Feldstein. Uh, thanks very much. <laughs> thanks very much. Well, let me start with the basic question that the program asks. Uh, is this a failure of capitalism or is it a failure of government? And at a basic level, I would say it's not really a failure of either. Certainly not a failure of capitalism with a big C, nor is it a failure of government with a big G. But lots of mistakes were, were made, and we're paying the price for those mistakes. And what you just heard from Peter is an example of how those mistakes were made in government policy, but also by the private institutions that took on those mortgage-backed securities, those private label mortgage-backed securities, not only in the United States, but around the world. I thought I should begin, though, by saying something about why the very serious recession that we're in now is quite different from the previous recessions that we've experienced in the post-war period. This is certainly not the first recession, but it is going to turn out to be the longest and deepest recession since World War II. If you look back at previous recessions, they were basically caused by the Federal Reserve raising short-term interest rates, raising the federal funds real interest rate in order to deal with the problem of inflation, either to bring down a very high rate of inflation of the sort we had at the beginning of the 1980s or to prevent increases in the rate of inflation. The Fed raised interest rates that slowed the economy, and when the Fed felt that it had succeeded in bringing down the rate of inflation, it could reverse engines, bring down the short-term interest rate, and that would lead to a recovery in the economy. Recessions were short, from the peak to the trough, 12 months uh, on average. Well, this time it was quite different. The recession was not caused by a tightening of monetary policy. It was caused by, if you want the most general description, it was caused by an underappreciation and underpricing of risk in the economy, and therefore a willingness of market participants to take excessive risks. Uh, we saw that in the Fannie and Freddie case. We saw it in the part of the homeowners who took those very highly leveraged mortgages. We saw it in the banks that not only in the mortgage area but in other areas took on excessive risk. We saw it um, in hedge funds, homeowners, individual investors, all of them taking on excessive risks. And when it became clear that risk was underpriced, when it became clear that these were riskier investments, whether it was home mortgages, it was in the subprime market, that the problem began to uh, display itself and we began to see an unwinding of this excessive risk. But it could also have been in low quality corporate debt or in the very high leverage associated with lots of financial institutions around the world. When that happened, then the economy went into the tailspin uh, that we're still working our way out of. Now, the fact that the recession was not caused by the Federal Reserve raising interest rates meant that the Fed was unable 
to solve the problem as it had previous recessions simply by lowering interest rates. So monetary policy had no traction. Once the Fed started bringing down rates and eventually brought rates down to zero, uh, the Fed funds rate down to zero, it still didn't have the effect of turning the economy around. Why? Because financial institutions, financial markets had become dysfunctional. Banks were unwilling to lend. Others were unwilling to provide credit to banks and other institutions as well as to non-financial corporations. So monetary policy lacked its traditional ability to turn the economy around. And that's why we did something that we haven't done for a long time and turned to fiscal policy, to a combination of tax cuts and increased spending. I, I surprised and probably disappointed some of my conservative friends when I published an article in the Washington Post saying, this was back in um, uh, December, I think, of 2008, so before President Obama uh, took office, saying that we needed to have a large fiscal stimulus because monetary policy was not going to work this time. Indeed, we did get a large fiscal stimulus, $800 billion over two plus years, but unfortunately it was very badly, badly designed. So that the $800 billion addition to our national debt will not bring us anything like $800 billion of increased GDP, uh, of increased spending. And Arthur gave you some of the reasons for that. Perhaps that was inevitable given the speed with which they tried to and indeed had to do something to provide uh, fiscal stimulus. But what the fiscal stimulus will do is to give us a little boost in GDP in the current quarter, the second quarter of this year and in the next quarter. That's going to take the rate of decline of GDP, which was a fall at an annualized rate of 6% in the first quarter of the year and in the fourth quarter of last year. That's likely to take that rate of decline down much closer to zero. So this quarter, we're likely to see a GDP growth of perhaps zero, perhaps minus 1%, minus 2%. In the next quarter, something similar to that. It's hard to make a precise prediction about that. But those will be the favorable effects of the fiscal stimulus. Problem is that it will then, after that, no longer be there. It will have raised the level of GDP, but it will no longer be increasing the rate of growth of GDP. So by the time we get to the fourth quarter of this year, I think the economy is still going to be struggling and we're not going to be out of this recession and into a full recovery. But that's a story for a different, for a different day. I want to get back to um, the issue of why the problems occurred, where were the failures. I think we saw significant failures on the part of the supervisors. Uh, as Peter said, banks are very heavily regulated. We don't really need new regulations telling banks that they should have adequate capital or banks that they should have adequate asset or qu high quality assets appropriate for the leverage that they're allowed to take. But we count on the supervisors. We count on the Federal Reserve, on the controller of the currency, which is part of the Treasury Department, uh, on the state banking regulators, we count on them as supervisors going into the banks to make sure that the banks do have adequate capital and that the quality of the assets is appropriate for an institution like that. Well, obviously they failed. It's hard to imagine how, but they clearly failed. So they told us over the last several years that the banks were adequately capitalized. Now, how did they come to that judgment? Well, they simply ignored some of the so-called off-balance sheet or special purpose vehicles and didn't take that into account because of technical rules which made, made it look like the banks would not really be responsible for those special purpose vehicles, for those off-balance sheet. But common sense would have told them that that wasn't true, 
that ultimately the banks were going to be responsible and therefore that the banks were undercapitalized, that they didn't have enough capital to deal with the possible risks that they faced. And similarly with respect to the assets. One of the remarkable things that contributed to these problems was the way in which mortgages were securitized. Um, one of the stories that Peter uh, alluded to but didn't develop uh, was that in the good old days, you got your mortgage with your 35 or even 20 percent down payment, uh, and the bank that gave you the mortgage kept it on its books. But then mortgages became securitized, that is to say they became um, bundled together and sold as a portfolio. Now once that happened, clever people figured out how it would be possible to structure those mortgage, mortgage pools in a way that gave those people who wanted to take high risk and get a high return one kind of security and those who wanted a very safe asset a different kind of security. And how did they do that? Let me give you a very simple example because it really is fascinating how one could take a portfolio of say a thousand subprime mortgages and Peter described what poor qualities they often had, take a portfolio of a thousand mortgages and create mortgage-backed securities, some of which could be rated as AAA. How do you do that? Well, you say of the thousand mortgages, the first hundred that fail, they're going, those failures, that risk is going to be borne by one group of investors who want to take that extra risk, take the risk of being responsible if as many as a hundred mortgages fail, but they will get a high rate of return if those mortgages don't fail. Then there'll be another group of investors which will take the next hundred mortgage failures. If fewer than a hundred mortgages fail, that second group will experience no losses, but if some of them do fail, if in other words there are more than a hundred failures, then that second group is going to suffer some losses. But for that, the market will give them a higher rate of return. But after you get to 200, well, it becomes very unlikely that you would have more failures. And after 300, virtually impossible. And so these were rated as AAA securities, basically telling the buyer that you didn't have to worry about failure here. Well, it turned out they did their calculations, they made their estimates of what the risks were of failure based on the experience in the glorious years in the first part of the decade when mortgages didn't fail because house prices were rising, the economy was booming, unemployment was coming down. But then after 2006, the bubble burst on these very high uh, prices of houses, house prices started coming down, the economy began to weaken and the combination of those things turned what looked like very safe securities into very risky securities. And so a little more common sense on the part of the supervisors would have blown a whistle early on and said, hey, that's not a triple A security. You're basing that judgment on a period of time when things couldn't go wrong if you applied some common sense, you would have to rate those in a different way. That would deter the banks from taking them on and we would not have contributed to this. So I put on my list of mistakes, the mistakes of the supervisors and the way they assessed capital and in the way they assessed uh, asset quality. So that's a kind of government failure, not so much of policy but of practice. Then in addition to that, we have failures of managers who really did not do a good job of incenting the people who worked for those firms, the, the investment banks uh, and others, um, in a way that encouraged them to take risk, but not too much risk. And the reason for that is you can invest in a way that works well this year and works well next year and works well the year after that, but there's a small probability that it's going to fail and when it fails, it really fails big time. 
And that's what's been called tail risk, a small probability in the tail of the distribution. And it's that tail risk that financial institutions, even the best, haven't really figured out a way to avoid um, incenting their investment managers, their risk takers, in such a way that they do not take excessive tail risk. If I'm a manager of a portfolio and I think, well, we could go 20 years before that earthquake hits my portfolio, I'll be out of here 10 years from now with 10 years of bonuses. And what management hadn't figured out and still hasn't figured out is how to incent that individual to take the appropriate amount of risk and to take tail risk uh, into account. So where are we in the end? In my judgment, there were a lot of technical failures. There were failures of private management. There were failures of the banks that took on these very high risk loans that Peter talked about. There, were, there was failure uh, certainly on the part of the government in pushing Fannie and Freddie into doing the kind of affordability lending uh, that got us into trouble. But going forward, the problem is not about a failure of capitalism. Uh, it's not a failure of big G uh, government. But I think what we need is to see improved, not new regulation, but improved application, improved supervision, and a lot more common sense. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, again, we are going to uh, we're, we're going to try to stop at ten. Uh, so we were, are going to go to questions uh, from the audience, which is uh, something we pride ourselves here at the institute. But let me just start out. Uh, given I think the the metaphor that we heard about diagnosis and prescription, and the coincidence of the Obama administration's uh, prescription. Uh, that we are all going to be reading about today and hearing more about. Uh, I wonder if, if any of you or each of you would care to comment. Uh, already we have, uh, we're hearing from uh, both critics on the right and the left, many of whom probably haven't even read the plan, that it is on the one hand just tinkering, that there was a great opportunity to make a truly sweeping and deep change in the regulatory system, and on the other hand, people saying that whether it's more power to the Fed or whether it's new agencies being created, that this particular uh, prescription is going to make the patient not necessarily any better and perhaps worse. And, and I wonder if, if any of you would care to comment, just, just quickly in the, in the context of the time we have, uh, on your first reactions to this plan and, and whether really it is a failure of, of a diagnosis and the prescription is going to be worse uh, than the disease. Let me start. Um, this is working. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, I will only deal with the part of the plan, and since uh, no one has defined it, uh, let me just outline it very, very briefly. Uh, the idea of the plan is to uh, have all financial institutions, not just banks, but all financial institutions that are large enough to create instability if they fail to be regulated in a special way by the Federal Reserve. Most of those, as I indicated in my first discussion before, uh, are not regulated at all for safety and soundness. Um, and uh, they, as a result, they are free of the kind of regulation right now that banks are subject to. Um, the prescription then is to subject all these non-regulated institutions to bank-like regulation. Uh, as I pointed out when I was uh, at the lectern a little while ago, regulation has failed for banks. And I think Marty made that clear too. We have had a very strong regulatory structure for the banks since 1991. At the time it was passed, it was right after the SNL crisis, we were told, and me, People in Congress were, were convinced that we had adopted such a strong regulatory structure for commercial banks that we could never have the kind of crisis that we had in the late 1980s and the early 1990s. Uh, but now we have a worse crisis involving specifically the banks. So the prescription here is to extend regulation 
from the banks to all of the unregulated parts of the economy. Um, obviously, to me, that doesn't make very much sense because it has failed with banks and all we will be doing is increasing costs, reducing innovation, impairing competition uh, for no good purpose. I haven't, read, I haven't read the document, so I think I should just wait until I've done my homework. <laughs> a safe answer. <laughs> the, the Obama administration in general has a, a certain set of precepts that it's using to guide its policies uh, on the way that it's uh, trying to solve the, solve the crisis or at least attenuate the, the suffering from the crisis. And, and I don't want to make one really quick comment that's less technical and, and, and I hope more controversial. Um, the Obama administration has a policy that the perpetrators in this crisis are to be called victims. That's a general policy in this crisis. Uh, there is no evidence that most people did not walk away from mortgages that they could afford. There is no evidence that there was a, not an overwhelming amount of fraud on mortgage applications. The 6 to 10 percent or whatever of early mortgage defaults in this country were defaults uh, from perpetrators of this crisis overwhelmingly, and there's simply not a responsible way to deny that that is the case. Now, that's an inconvenient truth. That's an inconvenient truth because it's much easier to say, look, we're all in pain, let's solve this problem, and let's not pay attention to the fact that it does real violence to our sense of fairness as a country when we bail out an entire system that was perpetrated, where the problems were perpetrated by a lack of ethics and a complete lack of re responsibility about politicians who looked the other way and created incentives for the behavior, deadbeats on Main Street and deadbeats on Wall Street who made this thing happen. You are not getting bailouts. They are. And there's something fundamentally unfair about policies that would make that the case. And I think that that is something we should be as worried about as anything else in the current policies. I have to ask two quick questions. First, was it a mistake to let Lehman fail? Uh, should I do it? Yeah. Um, yes, it was a mistake to make Lehman uh, to allow Lehman to fail after we had rescued Bear Stearns. Um, what happened after we rescued Bear Stearns is that the market reasonably believed that any institution larger than Bear Stearns would be rescued by the government, either ours or some other government, wherever it happened to occur. And uh, that, uh, the, uh, once, once that occurs, that's called moral hazard. Um, there's a belief that a pattern that the government has established will continue. It caused everyone to believe that they could deal with everybody else without worrying about the safety and soundness of these other institutions they were dealing with. When Lehman failed, suddenly everyone had to recalibrate completely how they thought about the people they were dealing with. That's why they stopped lending to one another. That created what is really the secondary crisis. The first crisis was the shutdown of the asset-backed securities market, which occurred a year before um, Bear Stearns got into trouble. That was, that was a crisis we'd never seen before. We'd never seen a, a market that was as active as the asset-backed market, that is, uh, uh, this, this would be mortgage-backed securities or securities backed by credit card receivables and things like that, just stopped. Um, so when, 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 when Bear Stearns was, was saved, the government established a policy that it violated in letting Lehman fail. So you either do it one way or the other. You let, Le you let Bear Stearns fail, take the consequences, which actually I think probably would not have been so severe. Or because we now see from Lehman that the consequences of a failure that was unexpected did not cause tremendous losses uh, out in among people who were dealing with Lehman. What it caused was this recalibration of people dealing with one another, a, a common shock. So you either do one or the other. The government made a huge mistake by bailing out one and then letting Lehman fail. Mr. Brooks, in your... Um presentation, you stated, I can't let the controversial moment pass, mm -hmm. um, 
You said there were three types of spending, I think uh, infrastructure, pork, and social engineering, and you mentioned something about a green project. You need to elaborate on that. I can't let that go. Sure, absolutely. The um, social engineering uh, gets a bad rap. Uh, it gets a bad rap from people like me. Uh, Even the statement. Sure. Even no, absolutely. No, 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 no. Absolutely. Absolutely. But uh, a lot of what we're doing, when, when the Obama administration says it wants to stimulate our economy on the back of green jobs, on the basis of green jobs, that's a kind of social engineering. And you know, a lot of reasonable people think it's a great idea, and some reasonable people think it might work, and it might be good for the economy. A lot of you join me in regretting a lot of his policies along these lines. But whether or not it's reasonable or not, that's not in question. It is a set of social objectives that we are trying to meet with uh, the stimulus spending as opposed to pure economic stimulus type of objectives. Now, maybe it would do both and that's great, but my, my point is really just that when we're trying to primarily trying to meet social objectives, that's going to be more controversial and I think reasonable people can disagree on whether or not, not that's an appropriate use of these funds. Okay. Mr. Feldstein, did you want to comment? Well, I think Arthur has backed, backed away from uh, what he said in the beginning, that it can do both and that was the point I would make. In other words, you can have something that deals with what economists call externalities. You can have policies that uh, are environmentally friendly uh, and that also provide a stimulus uh, to aggregate demand that create jobs. Now, there's then a tricky trade-off. There may be better policies in terms of pure job creation for every extra dollar of national debt, but maybe you want to give up some of that in order to satisfy other, uh, other goals. And I think that's, the administration may have gone too far uh, in some of the specifics, but I think uh, as, a, as a general proposition, you can't say that trying to, to deal with externalities is inherently a bad thing. Thank you. As much as I would, I would like to get into a discussion with my old friend Peter about whether Freddie uh, 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 and Fannie are really, at, and the Community Reinvestment Act are really at the heart of this, or bit players, I see very, very patient people in line here, one of whom may ask a similar question. So let's start over here, if we could. And if the questions could be short and to the point, uh, we'll have more time to hear from others. Thank you. Uh, you talked about creating jobs. I'd like to know how that relates to illegal immigrants. We have jobs being taken by illegal in immigrants. I'm not sure how many of them are paying income tax, but we have a high jobless rate. Now, I really think that we ought to take our own citizens and have them replace the people that really should be here. And I'd like to know what the panel thinks about that. You're an illegal immigrant. You shouldn't be here. <laughs> we, there, there haven't been good studies that ask how much of, say, the stimulus money is going into industries that disproportionately employ illegal immigrants. Uh, that's a very interesting thing to know. Uh, it would be an interesting thing to know because it would say to what extent are our financial, is the financial crisis bearing on what we can and should be doing with our immigration policies. I wish we could give you an educated answer. Um, with like so many things about the questions at hand, Somebody who comes to you and says, this is exact, these are exactly the data, and here are the answers, and here's the only thing that reasonable people can think, do not trust that person. <laughs> with, with that advice, we'll go over to this side of the room. Uh, thank you. I, I was wondering why specifically the, the role of uh, these collateralized debt obligations that were issued from companies like AIG by labeling that, as opposed to labeling them insurance, enabled the banks to leverage at a much higher rate than they would have been able to if these were labeled as insurance. Um, all right, I'll, I'll take that. I think you, you're you referring to collateralized debt obligations, but I don't think that's what you mean. The, it's credit default swaps. Um, CDS is not CDOs. <laughs> CDOs are a really big problem. CDSs, in my view, are not a problem at all. I'll tell you what a CDS is. Uh, you call it insurance. It's not regulated by like insurance, but it is a little like insurance. If, if you have in homeowner's insurance on your house 
and your insurance company, uh, that, that is you, you asking the insurance company to reimburse you if you suffer a loss. That's what a credit default swap basically is. Two institutions agree. One says, I'll reimburse you if you suffer a particular kind of loss. Now, if the insurance company fails, as AIG might have failed, for example, uh, but you haven't yet had the fire in your house, you haven't suffered a loss. And that is why there's a lot of misinformation about credit default swaps, a misunderstanding of what they actually do that makes it sound as though they are a serious problem. They are not. CDOs, in fact, are because CDOs are based on very bad mortgages, ultimately, and they are failing at very high rates because of what I talked about. But credit default swaps, a very complicated subject, are not um, a serious problem, and that market despite all the talk about it being so dangerous and so forth, has functioned perfectly through this period. It's the only market, really, that has not shut down and does give us a very good idea of the riskiness of certain companies that are protected by uh, CDS. Go back to this side. In the chain of failures that you discussed, it briefly was mentioned the rating agencies. I have uh, always thought it odd that if I wanted my company rated, I would pay Moody's or Standard & Poor's to rate me. And yeah. There seems something uh, at fault in that system. So I'd ask the panelists at least someone to opine on the suggestion that the rating agency, and, and despite the fact that you seem uniformly opposed to government intervention, that the rating agencies uh, be nationalized, that the rating agencies be taken over by the government instead of being a, a, a private system. You could have... Um private rating agencies as we do now, but have a buffer between the company and the rating agency. So when you want to get your bond rated, you would go to, in a sense, something like the Federal Reserve. And the Federal Reserve would say, well, given the structure of your um, uh, security, the charge is going to be X, and then we're going to draw randomly one of the three rating agencies to do the job so that you don't, you're not in the position of literally choosing and paying the rating agency for doing it for you. I think that would remove some of the, the temptations that may have been there uh, in the way in which securities got rated. But you know, the large financial institutions did their own rating. They would all tell you that we don't trust the rating agencies to tell us what these mortgage-backed securities are really worth, and so we have our own statistical models which are similar to the rating agencies. But they had the same characteristic of putting the wrong data in, that is, of looking at the experience of the, the fat years and not thinking that the years may not stay fat forever, that house prices may come down, that the economy may weaken. And so it wasn't just the rating agencies, it was the very process by which those ratings were developed. If, uh, one, one quick point. Um, nobody, in retrospect, should have trusted the rating agencies in this. But perhaps some of you join me in my skepticism that if you made them a government agencies, they would somehow become more trustworthy. <laughs> The, uh, I mean, the Securities and Exchange Commission missed Bernie Madoff for years. And if we made the rating agencies as reliable as the Securities and Exchange Commission, my guess is that that would degrade the performance of those agencies even further. <laughs> Do we have a question over here? Uh, thank you for your insights. Uh, I was struck by a comment a professor made on my very first class in college in 1966. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't ever want you to forget anybody that blames others uh, is a sign of immaturity. And it seemed like uh, that came out a couple times. My question is, what is your viewpoint of what has to happen and when it might happen so that the public will have confidence once again and see light at the end of the tunnel? Who would like to take yeah, that? I, I'm not sure that it is the public's lack of confidence uh, so much as it is in terms of the, the dysfunctional, I mean, let me back up and say this. Households are not spending. The saving rate is rising. 
Why? It's not because they don't trust somebody. It's that they've suffered a tremendous financial loss and are in the process of rebuilding their balance sheets. Uh, in terms of financial institutions, individuals are happy to hold money market mutual funds. They're happy to hold deposits in banks because they believe, I think correctly, that the federal government stands behind both of those kinds of, of, um, of savings vehicles. Um, the big problem that is driving the financial sector, the dysfunctional nature of the financial sector, is that the banks themselves don't know what their assets are worth. They don't know what the residential mortgages or particularly the commercial mortgages are worth because they don't know what the likelihood is of further defaults in the year ahead. And there's no government policy in place and there's no private action in place at this point uh, to deal with that. Over here. Uh, I'd like to address an issue that I think is one of the main causes of our economic crisis that hasn't really been touched upon. And that's a fiscal policy that on the one hand permitted the price of homes to increase by 60% overnight. And on the other hand, drastically eliminated the uh, income of the entire retirement community. And what I'm talking about is the arbitrary lowering of interest rates and especially mortgage rates from the 8% level to the 5% level. I was a home builder in Florida, and when that happened, I said, this is gonna be a disaster because what we're doing is we're arbitrarily letting home prices rise, which rose so fast that we had a tremendous investor market that collapsed. On the other hand, took away the income of the retirement community so that the retirement community had to be involved in investments that were more risky than normal fixed income investments. And I think the, the arbitrary lowering of interest rates and mortgage rates was the primary cause of the economic collapse and will continue to inhibit our future because we can't raise interest rates because of the tremendous debt we're incurring to correct the problem. So I'd like you to comment on that. I think there's a, a lot of support now among economists for the proposition that you stated that the Fed in lowering interest rates, uh, Fed funds rate came down to 1% in the early part of the decade and they promised that they would keep it low, that that led to this boom in house prices and the boom in the house prices was one of the reasons why everybody wanted, every potential subprime or all day borrower wanted to get out there and get as big a mortgage and as much housing as they could possibly get approval for. So I think uh, you're right, uh, that lowering of interest rates had that effect. I've never heard the second half of your argument before. It's an interesting one that the fall in fixed income interest payments to retirees and, and indeed, I mean, I think the, the, the form in which I have heard it, in which I think it's quite true, is that the lower interest rates caused everybody to, to reach for yield. And you reached for yield whether you were a retiree trying to make up for the fact that the interest had come down, or you were an investment bank who couldn't get significant yields on very safe assets, then you wanted to take more risk. And that led to what I said was the fundamental cause of the problem, the underpricing of risk and the excessive leverage that occurred as a result. Let me, let me just add one point. Sure, Peter. Briefly, and that is there are winners and losers all the time when interest rates are raised or lowered. And uh, I do remember the period in the early 2000s when we were quite, this was after the dot-com collapse, and we were quite concerned about deflation. Uh, deflation would be a terrible thing for the economy if it actually occurred. That is, prices continuing to spiral down. That's why the Fed reduced uh, interest rates so much. That benefited some people, homeowners. It hurt other people, um, fixed income uh, people who are receiving interest on bank deposits, which where the, where the uh, interest rate fluctuated. Um, but it's very, very difficult to uh, calibrate who is going to be a winner or a loser uh, when you're the chairman of the Fed and you, you're faced with a problem of uh, deflation, as well as Paul Volcker faced in the early 1980s with a problem of inflation, and he had to raise interest rates, causing huge losses for the SNLs and others. 
Um, so it's not, it's, it, uh, you, you can't start out at the beginning and add up all the assets and the liabilities on this balance sheet. It just, hey, you have to do what you have to do. Well, maybe they didn't have to do that. Uh, I think uh, Alan Greenspan said that uh, he thought about making monetary policy as a balancing of risks. On the one hand, there was, this in the early part of the decade, there was the risk of deflation, and that would be terrible, because once you got into that hole, how would you get back out of it? Uh, there was alternatively the risk of inflation. If you kept interest rates too low, that might lead to inflation. But I think he would then say, we know how to fix that problem. It's not so bad. And so therefore, given those two risks, he chose to work against the risk of deflation by having very low interest rates. What he didn't take into account was a third risk, the risk of an asset bubble. And that's what we got as a result of those very low interest rates. One question over here, please. Pardon me. I'd like for you to put this in Aspen Economics. It's my understanding that uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac only took loans under the jumbo limit, like $400,000. What created the problem and because there's no CRA or Consumers Protection Agency or anything else on the higher loans, can you explain and address the two-tier economics in that? Uh, you, you, the problem being the lack of jumbo loans today. Um, no, it, what's no, the problem? no. Why did why did that end of the um, spectrum fail? Because they were not being forced by CRA or HUD or any of those to take those make subprime loans uh, at that level. I see. So this is the loans that were not made by Fannie and Freddie, the, the so-called jumbo loans. Right. And again, the same, it's just a, a, the, the same process was working, and that is that there was a huge amount of subprime um, loans being made by banks. Some of these loans were within the amount that Fannie and Freddie would buy, and Fannie and Freddie largely bought those. Others were being made uh, outside the range that Fannie and Freddie would buy, and those were made by the Wall Street uh, banks, largely. Um, and they picked up those jumbo mortgages and securitized them in the way that Marty was talking about before, and those are failing right now. The reason why we don't have a jumbo uh, mortgage market today, very hard to have one, is the collapse of the asset-backed securities market that I talked about before that's been true for two years. The only group today that is buying mortgages uh, in any number are Fannie and Freddie that are operating under government control because they're insolvent, but the government is pumping money into them so that they can keep the housing market alive, at least for those kinds of mortgages that they are permitted to buy. But, but if I may just take, take a moderator's license and, and ask a, a slightly different kind of final question, uh, given that most of what we've been talking about today has related to uh, the financial sector. There's been some talk about, uh, Professor Feldstein, you talked about the failures or the inadequacies in, in the fiscal program. But looking at the economy generally, how should we be considering the impending uh, health reform legislation, cap and trade legislation? What are the implications as you see it in terms of fiscal policy and economic recovery? that would result from these very substantial uh, uh, intrusions in the economy? Um, let me take a crack at that. The, the thing that both of those have in common is that they are large tax, they are or will lead to large tax increases. Uh, cap and trade as a way of dealing with um, uh, carbon dioxide emissions uh, is in effect a kind of a tax on emissions of carbon dioxide, but we don't like to talk about taxes, so we've found this roundabout, complicated way of doing it. Uh, in fact, because of opposition in Congress to uh, auctioning off the permits that would normally go in a cap and trade system, they're being largely given away, but that's not going to um, reduce the fact or change the fact that the prices of all CO2 intensive goods and services, gasoline, electricity, and so on, are going to go up a lot. And the Congressional Budget Office estimates that for a typical family of four, 
that's going to raise their annual cost of living by $1,600. That's a lot for a typical family of four. When you think that a family of four uh, with $50,000 of income pays personal income taxes of $3,000, that's equivalent to a 50% increase. Not a good thing to do when you try to come out of a recession. Uh, the health uh, program, which has apparently run into a lot of, of pushback in the Congress and, and in the public, um, ultimately has to lead to much higher taxes. The estimates are $1.6 trillion over 10 years for the cost of that program. The administration says in a recent study by the White House that they will be able to deal with it by a uh, cumulative reduction in the quantity of services being provided. So over the next 15 years, our services that you and I and we all get, not just government provided, but throughout the economy, will be reduced by 25%. We'll all get one quarter less in services, but don't worry about it because these are the wasted services. The ones we really need are going to be okay. Well, I don't think the American public is going to want that. I think it's not going to be possible to reduce the costs in that way. And so I think if this passes, we're going to be looking at an enormous increase in taxes. And despite those increases in taxes, the fiscal deficits are pushing up long-term real interest rates. Because again, uh, as, as, as I think Arthur said, the estimates by the administration itself and by the Congressional Budget Office are that over this next decade, the national debt will triple, and the long-term annual deficits will run more than 5% of GDP, more than all of the household saving. It's bound to push up interest rates. Again, that's not the way to get out of a recession. So I think what they're doing in those categories is really very harmful. Uh, it may be what they want to achieve, but they're doing it at a time when the economy is weak and it will make it weaker. The, the, the punchline is taxes here. Uh, everything that we're doing is going, according to every reasonable expectation, is that we're going to have to find a way to charge you more in taxes. Now, there, the, the, the federal income tax, the way that we're structuring it, is not the best way to do it. An increased corporate tax and taxes on dividends and capital gains, this doesn't raise enough money. And that's the reason that we're talking about things like cap and trade or carbon taxes and ultimately we will turn our attention to a value added tax or a national sales tax. Um, now the reason that these things are controversial uh, right now and are hard to enact right now is because the left understands that carbon tax, cap and trade and carbon taxes and a national sales tax are horribly regressive. They're hor they hit the poor more than they hit the rich. The right doesn't like these things because they're a vast money pump on the American public. At AEI, one of the things that we understand is that these things will ultimately be enacted only at such time that the left realizes that they're a vast money pump and the right realizes that they're regressive. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like to thank our panel very much. Thank you all very much, and thank you to this very distinguished panel. <laughs>